Here are the top 10 good and bad things about the Nissan Patrol Y62, in my opinion. Starting with the good, number 10. Yeah, it definitely looks big, tough and imposing, especially this variant, which is the Warrior variant. So a lot of the trimmings are in black, like the wheel arch surrounds, some of the window trimmings, the side mirrors, A-pillars and the front grille. It definitely has presence on the road and stands out as something very tough and macho. Even these big all-terrain tyres and the Warrior features bespoke sort of machined face alloy wheels with black spokes. But even in the standard trim, so in Australia you can only get the TI and TIL and the Warrior, even in those standard trim levels, it still looks very big and, and imposing. It just doesn't have the sort of aggressive tones of the Warrior. Number nine. Inside, the Warrior has a bespoke trim with sort of Alcantara or suede or whatever you want to call it along the door trims and along the dash. And I think it just looks much better than the standard wood grain trim that the Patrol comes with in Australia. And even around the dash fascia, you've got sort of this piano black trim. It's not a huge deal, but I think it just improves the refinement of the Patrol, the Y62, because it is starting to get pretty old now. Number eight. Yeah, while we're in here, it is massive inside. Like it's one of the biggest SUVs you can buy in Australia at the moment. I know if you're in America, you can probably get much bigger SUVs than this, but right now, this is one of the biggest. The cabin is very long, the ceiling is tall. Yeah, if you can't fit in this, then you're probably breaking some sort of Guinness Book of Records for height. Rear seat room, I think, is better than the Toyota Land Cruiser. I don't want this to be about a comparison with the Land Cruiser, but it is, you know, one of its main rivals, long-time main rivals. But I think the rear seat room in the Patrol is definitely better than the Land Cruiser. You can't slide this middle row, which is a little bit disappointing, but really, you don't need to in terms of the middle row space. It's just you don't have the ability to, you know, move it forward a little bit to increase the third row of room. But I'll jump in the back in a second. You'll see that there's still plenty of room. But look at that. I've got so much leg room there, it's not even funny. If my knees were touching that, I'd have to be, yeah, seven foot tall or something like that. It's that much room. Got a center armrest here. It actually sinks down a little bit. I don't know if it's this, this model, maybe a bit worn out, but it's, it kind of sits down at an angle. I'd rather it be sitting up so it's level. Uh, but it does have reclining seats, I'm pretty sure. So you can recline it back and forth. And then if you're reclined back a bit, then that would kind of make a bit more sense. It would be, become a bit more level. You don't have anything advanced in the back here. It is showing its age a little bit. But you do have temperature control. And you can access the, the fridge that's usually in the TIL model. In this, it's just a big bucket. And you've also got charging ports, dual charging ports, and a power socket down below. I don't actually know what that big button blank is. It might be a, or might have been an ashtray back in the days when smoking was a bit more socially acceptable. But yeah, heaps of room. I've got climate vents up on the ceiling for all three rows. Getting into the third row is, is pretty easy. You just flip one. All I did then was just pull that, that tab and the whole thing flips forward kind of spring-loaded. And to climb into the back, just put this one up as well. Once you're back here, you've got decent room. This seat actually reclines back to give you a more relaxed sort of profile. And then, yeah, my knees are not actually touching the, the front seat, the middle row, but you might be able to tell that they're, my, my legs are kind of raised a little bit. So if I was a bit taller, obviously my knees would start to pop up even more. But you've got your own cup holders. And again, climate vents on the top and even a grab handle. The floor is pretty high in the, the Land Cruiser. Whereas in the Patrol, I feel like the floor sinks down a little bit more, especially in, this, in the first and second rows, but maybe not so much in the third row because there is a spare wheel underneath the car, uh, underneath the back here. So I guess that props up the, the, the floor a little bit. Overall though, this is a massive car. If you have a growing family or a grown family, 
then this is definitely suitable for you. Number seven. And just following on from that, the boot is also very large, even with the third row up. This model doesn't actually come with an electric tailgate, which is a little bit odd for its price. But yeah, look at that. You've got leftover room there for the shopping. And if you fold one of the seats down, you can see just how much space, how much depth you've got there. You've also got a power socket on the wall and some underfloor storage. Number six. Yeah, everything is really simple. All of the controls are clearly marked. You can tell that it's you know, designed for or from the American market because everything is written out in actual text. Bad luck if you don't speak or don't read very good English. But yeah, everything is very clearly marked and everything is very conventional. You've got your temperature control on either side. You've also got your, temp your volume over here, then your radio tuning there. This little section is a little bit confusing at first, but you get used to it. You just know that that's the settings area and you can jump to the climate and you can use this as a left and right, up and down kind of toggle as well as rotating around. I'll show you that when I start it up. For all these apps, you just rotate around and scroll to where you want to go or you can jump straight across by sliding the whole controller here. You've also got trip computer up on the top here and I love that you've got your dimmer switch for the instrument cluster right there. There's nothing wrong with having separate buttons in my opinion so you can just adjust it straight away. You know you don't need to have you shouldn't have to dig around for that sort of thing and you can go through the the trip information with this little button here. It is a very basic screen, which I'll get to in a minute. But yeah, you've got the information that you need right there. Number five. Under here, we've got something called hydraulic body control suspension. But with the Warrior, you can see those red springs. It does have a bespoke suspension setup. I think it's a little bit more comfortable in some ways, especially on rough conditions. Um, but overall, I think the Y62 is pretty comfortable anyway. There's a bit of sort of aftershock and a bit of shuddering going on when you're going over corrugations, just because it is such a big and heavy vehicle. Um, but I think with this, the Warrior suspension, that is managed a bit better. But yeah, overall, it's a comfortable setup and ready for off-roading. You've also got similar springs at the back and retuned dampers. And for a good view up my nostrils, you can also see the bash plate underneath with warrior written across there just for that real rally look but yeah it actually provides plenty of protection too it's pretty thick number four pretty obvious one but yeah off-road performance is excellent i'm just reading out some figures here so the warrior has 50 millimeters more ground clearance at 323 millimeters compared with the regular ti has the bigger tires and the recovery points, as well as a uh, full-size spare wheel with the the, uh, the chunky tires. They actually had to redesign the tow bar at the back so the spare tire fits underneath. And you can see it just fits. You've only got a tiny bit of clearance there. So if you've got a really muddy set of tires and one of them goes flat, you're gonna have to jam it in there to try and fit it. But yeah, it is great to see a full-size spare wheel, especially on a rough and ready SUV like this. One of the good things about having independent rear suspension is its ability to more comprehensively keep the wheels on the ground. So over these corrugations, it's, yeah, it's behaving just like a normal passenger car rather than you know, a heavy duty ute or, a, or a SUV with live axle, it tends to bounce around a little bit more. Whereas this is just, yeah, smoothly going across with no trouble. Look out rabbits. We'll do a little loop around here. So it goes down here and it comes back out this way. Uh, nothing here is, is that hardcore or serious. Um, but we can see how the patrol performs anyway. I've taken a lot of different cars around in the same circuit So I can sort of weigh up how easily it does it. We have had a bit of rain lately. So those 
there's a couple of mud sort of bog holes around the place so we can see how it goes through those I'm not going to bother about the drive modes here you've got a few different options there but I don't think we need to bother about anything like that it's also got a rear diff lock which again I don't think we're going to need um, but something I will do is turn the traction control off just because I, I know that some of these systems are pretty smart but I don't believe in you know applying braking power to the wheels while you're trying to get through something something boggy um, I, I know that there's yeah there's a lot of clever systems out there that can work it out but we'll just leave it off for today and have a bit of fun through some of these some of these mud sections again it's very comfortable through here this is quite bumpy but having the independent suspension makes it uh, yeah just a pleasure to drive along it doesn't feel annoying or anything like that I could drive for, for a lot of kilometers on the same terrain yeah even over that that's that's pretty bumpy there and it's just yeah soaking it up really nicely bog hole here this is pretty deep but it's only small we'll listen out for any scrubbing but there's none there at all the all-terrain tires on this really help uh, compared with the the standard tires they're much chunkier so you should be able to get further in very boggy situations such as this. This this has got a fair bit more water in it than the last time I was here, but we still should be, should be right to go through. Give it some power. Yeah, no problem at all. And down here we've got a bit of a steep section to go up and down. It is quite wide this <laughs> the patrol so you do have to be mindful of that if you're going down some very technical skinny tracks uh, that has got bush on the side and you're going to be putting putting pinstripes down the sides um, but we should be right here. It's, it's wide enough to fit this. But yeah, something to keep in mind. If you've got a lot of technical little tracks that you like going up and down, then this is probably not the best for that sort of thing. A little jimny will probably do a bit better in that scenario. So this is a bit wet, but we'll put it into the worst spot and just see how it goes. I'm just leaning on the throttle gradually and it's just walking up this no problem yeah no problem at all even though that is pretty steep it might not look steep on the camera on on camera but it is it is quite steep and it's wet as well and no problem at all down here there's another little boggy section we can go through there's two tracks um, they're they're pretty deep in that it can scrub the differential as you're going through in some vehicles but with independent rear you don't have that low hanging diff the diff can be quite high and then the the two axles can feed down from either side so you do have that advantage as well it just it's I think it's more of a, a personal preference I don't know what's actually better like if you look at the the old Hummer Hummer um, army vehicles they had independent suspension uh, but they had portal axles and things that allowed the wheels to drop right down anyway I, I don't know I, I guess it depends on your preference are you going to be doing really hardcore off-roading or a lot of touring with with plenty of off-roading um, because in that case, I think independent su suspension is better because <clears throat> you've got better dynamics on the road uh, and better comfort too. 
So there we go, the cameras have just engaged automatically. But it's not scrubbing at all. It's barely idling through here. It's got no problem at all. Yeah, it didn't scrape at all. Nothing. That was too easy. I get the feeling this thing can push on in very rough conditions. I have taken the, the standard TI in pretty serious conditions in the past and it yeah it goes really really well off-road i think uh it's one of the best off-road vehicles you can buy and I, now i think the the warrior is just that step above with extra gr ground clearance um and the chunkier tires you've just got even more capability number three with a gross combination mass of 7,000 kilograms, that suggests that this thing is heavy, and it is. It weighs 2.88 tons, which is, makes it one of the heaviest SUVs or seven-seat SUVs on the market. But what that means is, just getting some numbers up here. So if you calculate 7,000 minus 2,884, the curb weight, minus the 3.5 ton towing capacity, so that's the maximum in Australia allowed for a vehicle like this, you result, you're left over with 616 kilograms for your payload. So a lot of vehicles out there, they, they claim to have, or they do have a three and a half ton towing capacity. But by the time you factor in those calculations, you're not left with much payload in some of them. Whereas 600 kilograms in this, you can easily load it up with four or five passengers and some luggage or, or something in your trailer or a caravan and still have plenty of capacity left. That's what's great about big SUVs like this towing and real or realistic towing so you can jam your stuff all your gear and equipment in there and still be safely uh, able to tow with your vehicle number two the price is actually pretty reasonable especially if you compare it to the equivalent spec toyota land cruiser and as we know the land cruiser is its main sort of arch rival i think the since the, the base model of this patrol starts with the ti you're looking at kind of a VX Land Cruiser, and they're priced from around $120,000 before on-road costs. The TI version of this is around eighty-three dollars or $85,000 before on-road costs. So there's a saving of 30, 35 grand straight away. Now, as I'll get to in the, the bad section, fuel, fuel economy is pretty bad in this big beast. But if you use $30,000 as a sort of petrol fund, you'll get, you know, 100 or plus thousand kilometers with that. So think about that when you're choosing between the Land Cruiser or Patrol, you know, these things do chew a lot of petrol, but you're saving that huge amount in the first place. It just depends what, you, what you're after, if you like the diesel or the petrol more. Um, but yeah, I, I think the cost is definitely a very good, uh, an attractive feature. It's a, it's a great value package for what it is. The Warrior version is about $101,000 retail. And look, to be honest, unless you're serious about off-roading, you're probably better off with the TI. I think that's a better value proposition. But yeah, if you are going to mod modify it, then the Warrior makes sense. One of the first things you'll probably do is fit chunkier tires. This has already got it. So it's already covered by warranty. You don't have to worry about anything like that or insurance even. It's a factory vehicle like this. Even at 100 grand though, it's still very good value compared with, uh, or it can seem like very good value compared with the Land Cruiser. Obviously the Land Cruiser is a more modern vehicle. It's got more modern tech inside increased safety and, and so on. The, uh, the patrol definitely makes sense as a value proposition. And then the number one good thing about the patrol is the V8 engine. With the Warrior, that's enhanced further with a bimodal exhaust complete with side pipes. How cool is that? You still have a, a muffler at the back here. but even that sounds pretty good as it is. But then, yeah, once you get past a certain point of the, the revs or the throttle, some of that exhaust comes out through the side and it lets out a very nice crackly, uh, yeah, surprisingly AMG style of, of note. Have a listen.
petrol V8 engines are obviously on the, uh, the chopping block. You won't be able to buy something like this soon. In fact, the next, next Patrol is set to feature a twin turbo V6 petrol engine. So yeah, I think there's gonna be a lot of enthusiasts and fans out there that will be rushing in to buy the Y62 Patrol as it goes out of production. A bit like what we saw with the 200 series Land Cruiser, which went from a V8 diesel to a V6 diesel. It is a glorious V8 though. I've really loved this V8, even the standard one since it first came out. It just sounds really, really lovely. It's got that deep sort of thumping soundtrack to it or undertone that you get from a big capacity engine, 5.6 liter, 298 watts, plenty of power, 560 newton meters, also good amount of torque. For a big car like this, you might want a little bit more and I think that's what they'll concentrate with the next gen model. But even so, this thing it goes really, really well. It even has blipping of the throttle on the downshifts if you use the manual mode, which is just awesome. It feels like you're driving some kind of street machine with that thumping, uh, characteristic under there and then you're yeah, blipping the throttle as you're changing down. Look, it makes you want to drive it like a sports car, but it's not a sports car, unfortunately, but if you put that engine into something else, you would be, yeah, you'd be over the moon. That's how good the engine is. To have it in a big package like this, it's just a bonus really. We've heard about all the good things about the Y62, what about the bad? Number 10. I think the design is definitely starting to age a little bit. Some of the characteristics that stand out for me are the panels. They're just pretty straight panels. I mean, it's a nice clean design, but yeah, modern cars have some more kinks and, and little swirls and all sorts of things, whereas that's just one big straight panel. Uh, and then the trimmings, the chrome is a bit sort of, yeah, 1990s America in my opinion. I don't really like the chrome. And then the front end, it's got modern headlights, but yeah, it's all pretty blocky and it doesn't look super modern. Obviously this is an, a, a subjective thing. Everyone's got their own opinion when it comes to the styling of, of anything. Uh, but I think it is, it's starting to look a bit old. It, it, it literally has been around and it's pretty much the same form for quite a few years now. Number nine, to the average motorist, that looks like suspension. But to hardcore off-road enthusiasts, it's wrong suspension because it is independent. Independent basically means this, the left side, operates completely independent of the right side. So this swing arm here rotates from just near the differential just here, it swings up and down, and it doesn't affect the right side pretty much at all. Some vehicles have a stabilizer bar, which does kind of impact what happens left and right, but not like a live axle setup. So a live axle setup is where there's just a one big beam that goes straight across from left and right, and the wheels are connected to either side. That's a more, it's an old school setup, but for off-roading it can be better because if you're diagonally in a ditch, one wheel is being pushed down into the ground, and that's, that's kind of what you want because that's where the traction is obviously on the ground. Whereas something like this, you put it into a, a, an awkward situation and the, the left and right won't actually push each other down. It'll just be the springs pushing that, the, the wheel down and that's it. Another reason is a lot of live axle setups actually offer more suspension range. So this beam can swing further. In other words, that can drop right down to the ground. Whereas this, once this beam bottoms out, that's it. You don't get any, any further. And you also start to change the camber angle of the tire. So right now the tire is sitting pretty square on the ground. When that drops down, it starts to become uh, sort of positive camber. And it will, means that basically just this outside of the edge is touching the ground when this side's off the ground because it's rotated around and, and it's kind of on its side, slightly anyway. Whereas with a live axle setup, that is more likely to remain pretty level, uh, certainly more, way more than an independent setup. Number eight. 
as I touched on before, yeah, the Warrior is about $15,000 more than the, the version that it's based on, the TI. And yeah, you're not planning on doing proper off-roading or yeah, pretty serious off-roading actually. I don't think it's, it's, it's worth it, the extra 15 grand, you can pocket that and add it to your, your fuel account. Uh, because the standard TI is also very good off-road too, and it it's offers pretty similar performance um, in terms of traction and all that. You still get all the off-road driving modes and everything, uh, the hardcore drive system and the V8 engine. So everything is still there, just the 15 grand is basically, think of it as like accessories. If you are going to apply similar accessories, then yeah, it definitely can be good, uh, better value than going to an aftermarket store. And you can also factor in the warranty and insurance and that sort of thing. I guess the other aspect is the Warrior is engineered in Australia. So you are supporting local jobs and local engineering. Number seven. Yeah, it's extremely heavy. 2.8 tons is about as much as you want to be carting around. If you've got your family in there, that's a, that's a three ton package you're driving around. And it does affect some things such as your braking performance, wear and tear on parts, so that the tires are gonna be really scrubbed in there because of the weight. And it also affects or impacts off-road performance. So if you're in very sticky mud or soft sand, you might be better off with a lighter weight vehicle. They can sort of scamper over the top, whereas this is gonna bog down and really push into the ground. But as I mentioned, weight can be good, especially if you're doing a lot of towing. Number six. It does miss out on some of the safety systems that a lot of the rivals are starting to offer and certainly a lot of the crossovers and general SUVs uh, come with, such as high speed autonomous emergency braking. This doesn't feature that, it just has normal low speed autonomous emergency braking. So basically, uh, if, it is, if a car pulls out in front of you or something like that and you're only going you know, 30 or 40 kilometers an hour, the brakes will automatically be applied. But if you're going on a highway at 80 kilometers an hour, and there's a car that's stationary and you don't see it for some reason or a car pulls out and you don't see it for some reason, this doesn't provide that extra safety net. There's some other bits and pieces that it misses out on too and it's actually not rated, the 2024 model is not rated by ANCAP. There is some good news though, this doesn't come with driver attention, warning, blah blah blah. So there's no forward facing camera or sorry, rear facing camera up here on the steering column or on the, on the pillar monitoring your every movement. I absolutely hate those systems. I don't think they provide added safety at all. I think they provide added annoyance. So doing without that stuff can be good, especially if you're a bit of an old school driver like myself. Um, it's actually good that you don't have to spend your morning turning it all off every time you start the car. This is just, just doesn't have it, so you don't have to worry about it. It does come with blind spot warning, so a little light will flash up there showing you when there's a car uh, in your blind spot. And yeah, it comes with a lot of airbags and things like that. It doesn't come with a center airbag, which is required now for a five-star rating. Uh, but because it's not a brand new model, they, they don't test it or they don't uh, you know, give it demerit points because of that. Um, but yeah, it's still reasonably safe. It's just not quite as safe on paper and probably in, in the real world uh, as some of the more modern products that are out in this space. It does come with a, a surround view camera system. Uh, it's only on this little screen, which I'll get to in a minute, but it's better than having nothing at all. And you can change the view as well. You've got a sort of top-down view of the, of, the, of the side. And just a straight rear view. Number five. Yeah, we'll have to go for a drive to explain this, but basically the steering is very light around center. And when you just around town and things it, it's kind of fine but when you're driving on, on on the road it just feels a bit odd and almost jerky and, and a bit sort of unnerving a little bit um, it's, it's hard to explain but you'll have to take one for a test drive and, and see for yourself but it's just not as as nice as I would have liked um, it doesn't have a sort of progressive feel it's just very light and flimsy uh, when you're going slow and then it kind of weightens up it has a little bit of weight once you're going but not really also, the steering column doesn't move up and down. It only goes in and out, uh, which is a little bit annoying because I might want it just down a little bit or someone might want it a bit higher if they're a taller driver. On the highway, it's actually pretty touchy. When you're sitting on centre, there's a bit of dead play, but as soon as you get past that point, it's suddenly, I'll just change lanes here. It sort of really swings and it's sort of, you feel that it's top heavy uh, just through the steering. 
I don't know how to fix that. I think maybe progressive steering ratio might help. It's just not as comfortable as some of the rivals. Number four. Look, this is not a slow vehicle and it's not intending to be a sports car, but it does have a 298 kilowatt, 5.6 liter V8. You might be expecting better performance from it. Uh, I did, did some testing in this the other day and it did 0 to 100 in about 7.9 something seconds. I don't think it actually shows on paper, but it would be heavier. So you've got that big protection plate underneath as well. That's all going to weigh something, the big tires even. Uh, it's going to add extra weight. I think on paper this is 72 kilograms heavier, which is not a huge amount to make a big difference in performance, um, but you might be expecting uh, quicker timing. And in fact, I've timed the Land Cruiser GR Sport in about 7.8 seconds with the diesel. Number three. Now overseas, the Y62 was updated around 2020, I think it was, with a brand new dashboard design. But in Australia, we get this old setup. It's, uh, it just doesn't provide that functionali functionality. I do like the buttons and things, as I said, uh, but that screen is, is tiny. And it doesn't even come with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. And I know that sort of those sorts of connectivity apps are becoming very popular because you can just mirror a lot of your phone apps straight onto the screen so you don't have to ever touch your phone. I don't know why Nissan Australia hasn't or they haven't bothered to to introduce that new touchscreen setup and the new dash, especially as they're starting to run out the Y62, or they will be soon. Um, as the new model comes in, it'll be a great way to send it off, I think. And they'll sell a lot more of them, I reckon, anyway, because you, you jump into this and people that want the modern stuff, they're going to look at that and go, no, that's not what I'm, why is that so old? And they'll jump into even the Land Cruiser 300 series, much more modern, bigger screen, um, more connect connectivity. Number two. Likewise, the instrument cluster is definitely very old. It's got this little digital section in the middle there. As I said, it, you know, it's got your basic trip information, but nothing else really. Um, pretty warm day today. And yeah, just pretty basic dials and everything. It's just, yeah, a little bit old school, especially if you're comparing it to some of the more modern rivals. You're going to look at that and think, no, it's a bit yuck. And then the number one bad thing about the Y62 has got to be the petrol. It's got to be the fuel consumption. As you might have seen there, I'm averaging 18.1 litres per 100 kilometres. I haven't done anything drastic. I mean, I did the performance testing the other day, but other than that, I've been driving it on the highway quite a bit, actually. Um, I did drive one of these uh, interstate last year, and you can record a lower fuel consumption than the official rating, but the Warrior is rated at 14.4 litres per 100 kilometres uh, as you know the average official rating, which is pretty high, whatever way you look at it. Uh, but again, if you're weighing up between the Land Cruiser and the Patrol, you do have to factor in that price difference. If you're saving twenty or dollars $30,000, that can be uh, attributed to the, or that can be put aside for the, for the petrol in the Patrol. So there we have it. Top 10 good and bad things about the Nissan Patrol Y62 specifically the Warrior. Have I missed something? Please let me know in the comments. And yeah, I really look forward to seeing what Nissan does with the next generation. I don't know if it's called a Y63, but the next generation patrol and seeing what traits they can, they keep or characteristics they can keep from the from this awesome model, the current model, um, but also what sort of advanced or more advanced features they add to the next generation model. I don't think it's coming out for another at least 12 months or more. Uh, so this will be around for, for a lot longer if you do want to jump in the V8 before it becomes extinct. Thanks for watching.